after a faultless drive. Carl Tundu and Tim Jessup were ahead by nearly six minutes and as they arrived for the final service of the day, thoughts were now on the strategy for the final leg. I think I'm going to back off. I can afford to lose a minute a section easily. So I think that's the most sensible thing to do. At the end of leg one, Carl Tunda was so far out in front that the win was almost assured. Focus was now on the two remaining podium places. It was still open between any of the next five drivers. Whilst the crews refreshed their cars in the service park, little did they know that the area was swamped in history. During the First World War, British forces had a garrison in Il Bissell, and the service park was used for polo matches, best visualized when it's in its natural state. The adjacent road to the Tanzanian border lies on the same route the explorer Joseph Thompson followed on his travels, and the nearby hills were used to relay messages along the old Arab slave trade route. But today, it was all about the matters at hand. Yeah, it's official. He is square. <laughs> to avoid the lengthy transport distances to and from the Nairobi base, the cars were held overnight at Isinya, where the service park would be based the following day. With the cars receded to run in their overall standings, it was Carl Tundu and Tim Jessup who headed the field, lining up with the first control of the final leg. Leg 2 comprised of three sections, amounting to 102 competitive kilometers. Stages 7 and 8 were run back to back, separated by a short stretch of transport, with a combined distance of 56 kilometers. The final section was the fastest stage of the rally, 47 kilometers of flat out motoring across vast African plains. The stages were less technical than on leg 1, although this was relative as the speeds were faster, requiring just as much, if not more, concentration. Into easy right. All Carl Tundo and Tim Jessup needed was to stay out of trouble. They were no longer on the attack and were just pacing their rally, counting down the miles to the end. They only claimed the 10th quickest time on stage 7 and were third on stage 8, but it was enough to maintain a more than healthy lead. Jamie White and Phil Arconel had a similar strategy, with the priority of staying at the front of the ARC race, but were only too aware that they needed to maintain a fast pace if they were to secure second overall. The shorter stages made gaining time more difficult, which the Madagascans hoped to use to their advantage, but they were dealt a cruel hand when they punctured on stage 8. It was a slow change costing six minutes, dropping them from third to eighth. I go I don't go so fast. Uh, yes, sir, but no bump, no no shocks. I don't know why and uh, so you have seen the tire. Uh, it's very I am I am unlucky. I am lucky. Everyone behind moved up a place with Ian Duncan and Amos Sludge inheriting the now vacant third place. Driving at 100%, Ian was totally relying on the instructions given, and when one came up late, they were fortunate the roadside was flat. Into cut medium left. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. Chas Mangat and Gihan De Silva were chasing hard, taking the section win on stage eight, but it wasn't enough to close the gap on Duncan. They would either have to accept fourth or find some more speed on the final stage. Whilst the crews were concentrating on achieving the best times possible, inside the cockpits the high temperatures were put aside until the end of each stage, where the Keringet water provided by the sponsors was more than welcome. Raji Baric and Raju Chaga were in awe of the company in which they were racing, which gave them added impetus. 
they gained on stage 7, setting the second quickest time and were now lying in fifth. It's extremely flat out. It's very, very, very fast. So it was, it's been nice and we, you know, it's not every day we get to be competing with Ian and Rottenback and everybody. So we had Ian in five seconds in front of us and Rottenback a second behind us. So that's a nice place to be. Uh, it was on these stages that the top and speed of the S2000 put Conrad Rottenback and Nicholas Klinger at a real disadvantage. With Judah Runner Rivello dropping back, they gained a place and were now second in the ARC race and sixth overall. You know, we're here for the, the African Championship. Um, so, yeah, I think we're lying second now. The guy in front of us had a puncture, so it's a bit unfortunate for him, but uh, good news for us. So, so we just want to get through now and uh, not have any problems and do any more damage to the car. Quinton Mitchell and Tim Challen took the stage win on Section 7, gaining 45 seconds over the two stages, closing to within a minute of Rotten back. If they could maintain this pace, they could claim 6th, but for now, we're in 7th. I think we've got about uh, 20 seconds or something like that to make up in the last stage, which hopefully it'll suit us because this car's got quite long legs. I mean, we've we yesterday we had a top speed of 217 and we hit it again today. So Imran Mogul and Mutuma Marimba had shaken off driving cautiously and were back to their normal impressive pace. They needed the stages to be longer, but did enough to recover a place and claim ninth. Hadip Rissi and Ravi Sonny were frustrated having had to stop when the bonnet flipped up. Whilst they were quick, they lost 14 seconds which was enough to drop a place to 10. I have to fight the last stage is where the rally starts for me. Uh, because we have to, uh, there are only a few seconds between the three or four of us and we have to fight to the end. The attrition rate continued to increase. And adding their names to the greying list were Alex Horsey and Frank Gitao with the Evo 10. On stage 7, they gained 40 seconds on the car ahead, but were still in 12 when the rear diff turned to mush, forcing them to limp out of stage 8 and out of the rally.